Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Widera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who is our guest today? Today we have a guest from Boston on the other side of con- the country. We have Karen Ladin, who is an assistant professor. She's in the Department of Occupational Therapy at Tufts. She is a social science researcher. She is a bioethicist. And welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Karen. Thanks. Happy so, to be here. So we always start off with this podcast with a song request. You got a song for Alex. Sure. Alex, can you play Weezer's The Sweater Song? If you want to destroy my sweater, hold this thread as I walk away. As I walk away. Watch me unravel. I'll soon be naked. Lying on the floor. Lying on the floor. I've come undone. Yeah. <laughs> about as much singing you're ever going to get that's out of That's pretty good. That we got Eric to sing. That's, that's it's huge. unusual. <laughs> he that likes the great. Weezer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, thanks for joining us, Karen. Um, before we start talking about some of the, the work that you've done around dialysis, uh, how did you get interested in this subject? That's a good question. Um, so I think I, I got initially interested in um, dialysis through some of the research that we had done with, um, with kidney transplant patients. Um, and we had uh, a pretty large study going on um, with patients who are thinking about transplant and looking at um, their decision-making processes. And so we spent a lot of time in dialysis centers um, and just, you know, talked to a bunch of patients, um, some older patients especially, um, and learned a little bit about kind of what their process was like. Um, and I think really just through spending those hours in the centers and with nephrologists and surgeons, we kind of, um, I became really interested in, in what goes into a decision to initiate dialysis, which is kind of such a life changing therapy. Yeah. So tell us, um, tell us about, uh, these studies that you did. I don't know if it's easier to start with the patient side or with the physician side about this, this issue of, um, initiating dialysis. Yeah. Um, well, for for me, it really started with the patient side, um, and I think you know going into um, to thinking about kind of um, for you know for for people trained in health policy, I think oftentimes what's interesting to us is when there's kind of a very big difference between treatments, um, either between countries or um, things like that. And so there had been a series of papers that had come out. Um, looking at treatment of um, older adults with and without dialysis um, in the UK. Um, What was really interesting is that they had kind of a very different um, um, kind of baseline for what would qualify for dialysis um, treatment. Um, And so not everybody was referred. It wasn't kind of inherent that people would just start dialysis. Instead, it was this more deliberative decision-making process. And so I was interested to see um, you know, how that would work in the U.S. And when we started talking to patients about, um, gosh, about like eight years ago now, um, what became really clear is that most patients did not experience this as a decision at all. And so it really changed the way in which we decided to study this. I and mean, we had asked people, you know, all these, <laughs> what we thought were thoughtful questions about kind of tell us more about what were the factors that were involved and how did you come to this decision and all of this. And essentially we just got back kind of two different options. One is that it wasn't really a decision at all that they they had felt that they needed to start it or that they would kind of die immediately um, or that it wasn't their choice it was more of their physician's choice which we thought was also really interesting and you have some great i mean disturbing <laughs> quotes here about um you know the patient's perspectives um on starting dialysis and i've kind of um just kind of underlined a few here um, uh, um, you know, what is, wh- how, how much, how much autonomy, for example, do the patients feel that they have in making these decisions? Um, the, the kidney doctor is the one that said I should have, di- that I should have dialysis. Um, lying on the bed three hours a day is not my way of living. 
They had a hard time convincing me. I finally did agree. Sometimes you feel like you don't have a choice. And, and then they said if I didn't do dialysis, I might as well plan my funeral. I mean, this is really yeah. stark, right? Um, you, as you were saying in the be, uh, you know, earlier, in Europe, it does sound like there are choices here. Patients may feel more engaged in the process of decision-making. They may feel like they have a choice. And there may actually be a choice because there's another option, conservative management. It doesn't sound like these patients feel like they have much of a choice here in the U.S., yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it was really, um, it was really striking to us as well in, in hearing these patients and hearing them kind of recount their narratives, um, that they really, you know, felt very strongly that they didn't have a hand, um, and that they really didn't have a decision point kind of to the extent that they were surprised or confused about even the, the question about, you know, well, what else would I have done? Um, and to us, I, I think, you know, from a from a policy perspective, especially it's really important because for many of the patients, especially that we were interviewing, um, they're they're older patients, they have many comorbidities, and it really it seemed to be more of a question of dialysis initiation as a quality of life choice as opposed to necessarily um, increasing longevity. And yet for most patients, they really didn't um, have any sense that this was an option that would affect their quality of life and that there were others that they could choose from as well. And, and as, as we were, um, so, so let me just re reiterate what you said there, um, uh, make sure I understand it. So if the, for the patients, it seemed like they were more interested in quality of life concerns, but the physicians were presenting this as an issue of um, survival and length of life. Is that Summarize some yeah. of these. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. And it, you know, it wasn't clear to us kind of why that was, you know, why were nephrologists really focused on this um, as a, on survival as opposed to on quality of life? Is it that they, you know, really thought that dialysis was going to prolong the life of these patients in particular? Um, you know, or did they, did they know were aware of the, the literature about conservative management? Um, you know, why did they not engage in these kinds of conversations and why didn't they tell patients more about their prognoses? Um, and what was interesting is actually the National Kidney Foundation president, um, Jeff Burns, said um, in one of his speeches at, um, at the kidney conference a few years ago, he said that patients care about quality of life above all else. But too often, healthcare providers and family members are only focused on mortality. Um, and that's really what what we found that really resonated with our patients' experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's a nice bridge to talking about the other paper. Well, Eric, did you have a question? Yeah, about no. This so it was this this other paper that yeah. um, you just got published in American Journal of is it kidney diseases AJKD? Yep. Uh, discussing conservative management with older patients with CKD, uh, an interview study of nephrologists. So. What did you learn about the, the kidney doctors and how they're thinking about this? Yeah, so it was really interesting. So after kind of having these conversations with patients, um, you know, we came away with the thought that um, they really were were underinformed about their options. And, um, you know, sometimes there's a discrepancy between kind of what patients report and remember and what they were actually told um, or what the doctors perceived that they told them. Um, and so we thought it'd be a good idea to interview um, nephrologists and assess kind of what they were um, telling patients, older patients who are facing dialysis decisions as kind of a matter of um, their, their standard practice. Um, and so we interviewed 35 nephrologists from 18 practices um, across the country and uh, about a third described routinely um, discussing kind of conservative management with their patients. So that's to say two thirds did not do that. Um, and we found that there were a lot of barriers in how nephrologists perceived their own role um, and um, the potential consequences of describing conservative management um, to, to older patients. There was a sense that, um, that they were kind of ill-equipped to have these conversations. There was a sense that they didn't want to deprive patients of of hope, um, a strong preference, as we see kind of in the um, the applied ethics and economic literature towards kind of active uh, treatment options. So they were viewing conservative management as no care. Mm. Um, 
and confronting a lot of institutional barriers to offering conservative management. Yeah, and again, oh, go ahead. Can you describe what those institutional barriers were? Yeah, so, um, and this was true for both academic and um, and community-based practices, um, but there were uh, there was a lot of concern over time constraints. So there was a perception that um, kind of a discussion of conservative management required more time, um, and you know you might encounter a lot of pushback or patients shutting down, and providers were not sure how to handle that kind of within the the context of their regular visit. There was difficulty um, with care coordination, especially with other, um, with social workers or with palliative care or with primary care. Um, and the thought was that, you know, if, if a nephrologist is going to offer conservative management, they really need all these other providers to be on board so that the patient doesn't get, you know, mixed signals or um, isn't kind of started on dialysis emergently. Um, and I know that that's, um, that's a challenge that, you know, nephrologists feel. Um, and then finally, you know, there's a lot of financial incentives for offering dialysis and n- a number of nephrologists voice their concerns about like not fully understanding the financial model around conservative management and what that looks like, whether it be supported by their institution. That is a key driver right there. And yeah. you actually sent me a, a link to this uh, fantastic John Oliver um, uh, segment. We were just uh, watching a little bit of it again. Here. We'll have it on our Jerry Pal post attached to this blog. We'll have that link. And he goes into the sort of economics uh, beh- that sort of dro- is a major driving force, in particular uh, calling out DeVita, one of the major um, dialysis companies, um, for uh, about the ways in which they have really designed their business model around maximizing profit uh, for shareholders rather than providing the best care uh, for patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, it's both hilarious and, of course, disturbing, as many of John Oliver's segments are. I don't know if you want to say anything about that John Oliver sketch. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in the rec- in the past year or year and a half, there's been a lot more attention to this. I think both John Oliver, um, who really does, uh, I think, the best job in kind of <laughs> integrating um, the funny and um, kind of... Um, dramatic and desperate aspects of this, but um, but also the Boston Globe and many other papers have, have written about this. And I think um, it is unique in American healthcare um, compared to, to other countries that um, a large part, uh, the vast majority of dialysis um, care is provided by private companies. Um, and so there are these kind of competing incentives in terms of um, uh, providing dialysis and even referral to transplant. I think overall, um, people are optimistic that that things are moving in the right direction. It's just that they're moving very slowly. Mm-hmm. So, um, we're hopeful that some of this research can kind of help, um, at least identify some of the levers and mechanisms for change. And you also discussed in your AJKD article, uh, the providers feel some moral distress over this too. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So what was really interesting to us, you know, I think in speaking with the patients and hearing about their stories and, um, you know, the the really moving narratives that they shared with us, it was hard to see how and why nephrologists would withhold this information. Um, You know, and I think in speaking with nephrologists, we really understood um, kind of how deeply divided they are over their role and um, how difficult it can be for them, both in cases where conservative management should have been offered and followed and a patient gets kind of emergently dialyzed um, to pretty devastating consequences, as well as the reverse, where they have, you know, these longstanding relationships with patients and they, you know, they offer them conservative management and the patient may feel abandoned or they may feel like, you know, the nephrologist is withholding care. Um, with respect to kind of the moral distress aspect, we did see that um, many patient, many nephrologists who changed their practice, who started offering conservative management more routinely, did it as a result of kind of these very salient um, encounters or, or experiences with patients where they remember that, you know, there was this horrible outcome, this patient who was, um, you know, 
to quote them, you know, tortured at the end of life and that they felt that um, there had been a better option and that they had wished that they were more vocal at the time. Um, and actually those nephrologists who um, now routinely offer it and, and kind of describe to us the evolution of their approach um, tend to feel better about, um, you know, whether or not their patient chooses conservative management. They feel like they're offering the best standard of care. Mm, that's terrific. And yet, I just want to read a few more of these quotes because they're just so striking and sort of bring home, crystallize this, these perspectives. Here's one f uh, nephrologist who's saying, um, I view myself as someone who tries to provide a ray of hope for people who are sick. I, I've seen enough people who feel so much better after I had dialysis. Um, so this is like, they, they feel like they have to offer it because they have to offer some hope and they don't see conservative management as hope. Here's another quote. Mm -hmm. I let her go six months because she didn't really exhibit symptoms. She's like, I feel fine. Then one day she walked in and I said, that's enough. I've given you your time and now I think we have to get you into dialysis. Really sort of turning the screws on people who are choosing conservative management. And then finally about prognosis, um, you know, discussing the uncertainty, tremendous uncertainty in prognosis for patients with chronic kidney disease. I don't know the answer to prognosis questions. I actually don't address prognosis, right? Is, is that the yeah. same thing you heard from the patient side as uh, physicians' unwillingness to discuss prognosis? Yeah, I mean, we, um, yeah, I, you know, for the most part, um, our our work and many others have found that, you know, even as you guys know this really well, you know, even when the prognosis is really dire, um, patients want to know, most patients want to know. Um, and we certainly heard that from patients that we spoke with. Um, and I think, you know, part of the, you know, part of the difficulty with nephrologists, especially here, um, is that they have these really longstanding relationships with the patients and they don't want to, they don't want to um, injure those relationships in any way. Um, and I think to some degree, um, they may be they may be optimistic anyway. Um, so we did hear from a lot of nephrologists this kind of like Wobegon effect of like, I know that, you know, conservative management on average may be, may offer the same survival as dialysis for older patients with comorbidities, but my patients do better than average. Um, and we heard that kind of, that was a refrain among many, um, but yeah, from patients we did hear that they, they wanted to know their prognosis and some of them, um, you know, to the degree that this wasn't brought up, felt like it wasn't brought up because it wasn't relevant to them. So when we asked them, you know, did your doctor ever tell you, you know, did you talk about advanced care planning? Did you know, did you talk at all about end of life? Do you know, um, did they ever use the word prognosis or talk about how much time you'll have? you might have left. Um, they said, no, that doesn't apply to us. If, you know, we're obviously not in that stage, our doctor would tell us. Um, and that was really difficult to hmm. hear. And you also have this other paper in the Gerontologist titled End of Life Care. I'm not going to worry about that yet. That's a quote. Health literacy yeah. gaps and end of life planning among elderly dialysis patients. And in this study, you found that, um, you know, so as we know, you know, there's huge, high, very high risk for mortality with um, dialysis. So um, with chronic kidney disease, as John Oliver noted, it's the ninth leading cause of death, and I'm sure it's a comorbid, comorbid illness for many other causes of death. And yet, despite that, um, only 13% of patients um, that you studied uh, here in these 31 elderly dialysis patients had discussed end-of-life preferences with physicians. And you found uh, some serious concerns about health literacy and misunderstandings. Do you want to say a little bit more about what you found there? Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, like I said, you know, very few patients had had any kind of conversation about um, advanced care planning or about kind of the severity of their illness. Um, and what we learned was that. Um, Meant there were a lot of misunderstandings, even in kind of commonly used terminology that we took from the, the literature, the um, kind of patient handouts that the nephrologist offered patients, um, including, I think, what was most striking to me was actually the word intervention. Um, so oftentimes what we found was that patients um, didn't realize they understood 
the degree to which um, they would have to come to the clinic for dialysis, that dialysis might involve needles, uh, but they didn't understand that they might need a surgical procedure to, you know, to create a fistula and, and fistula maintenance and all of that. Um, and the nephrologists, when they were describing it, are often using the word intervention. Um, mm. And so patients, many of them actually were really put off by this word. And I think it kind of coincides with reality TV shows about interventions with families. Um, and so oh. many kind of understood this word to mean like an intervention. And one of us even said to, one said to us, like, I don't need an intervention. I don't have any problems of that nature. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I love the words that we use and recognizing, like, oh, that's not how most people right, perceive it. Right, reality check. It's like, right. the test was negative. Right, oh, right. my God, it's negative. I'm going to die. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, so that was, um, that, was, that was really an eye-opener for us. And we had to think kind of long and hard even about kind of the, the questions that we were asking. Um, but, yeah, I think... Um, I think there there needs to be a lot more attention to kind of health literacy around end of life conversations and what are patients walking away with and um, you know are they understanding it. Um, it also think- sounds like from your paper is that the the patient also feels like like they have a role to play and their role is to the patient and potentially that is um, uh, not challenging physicians with some of these things, including discussing prognosis. Um, one of your lines said, patients frequently felt shut down by physicians when asking about implications of dialysis for quality of life and prognosis. And uh, they weren't really, they didn't feel comfortable initiating these discussions. Yeah. So that um, that came through. Um, I, think what's, I think what's really interesting is kind of both nephrologists and patients feel really uncomfortable having these conversations and don't feel like it's their role. The patients really did. Um, it you know it was. I think it's especially given that it's end of life or last stage of life kind of conversations. Um, it was really troubling um, and distressing to hear them kind of not feel like they could get an answer um, or that they could um, they could really you know, push on their nephrologist to address their concerns. Um, yeah, it, it's troubling. And I think even more so, one of the themes that came out of the patient interviews is that for many patients who chose dialysis, dialysis kind of like it, it became their job, right? So they described kind of this new stage of life where they're now trying to be a quote unquote good patient. Um, and, you know, they would talk about kind of what that involved and that involves, you know, coming to all of their dialysis sessions and their follow up visits and their diet and, you know, all of these things. Um, and when we asked them about their preferences and goals, kind of overall, what was important to them in life, they were there were very limited overlaps <laughs> in terms of kind of what the patients thought that they wanted to do in their last stage of life and what they actually were doing um, in terms of, you know, limited social participation and kind of even the, the symptoms of fatigue and appetite were not really resolved by the dialysis for many of them. Um, and many of them kind of focalized their desires, especially as they're aging, to, to travel, which was, mm-hmm. um, it's possible on dialysis, but it's difficult. Mm-hmm. They kind of wish they would have known that. So this is terrific. We've, you know, your work has really sort of granular, grounded in the experience of patients and doctors who are grappling with this in the U.S. Um, can we take a step back now and look sort of more bigger picture? What do you see um, as the the major things that need to be done in order to change the system, the culture, uh, our approach to these conversations? in order to improve care for older adults who are living with chronic kidney disease? Um, that's a very good, <laughs> very good and big question. And um, you don't have to have all the answers. In right? 30 seconds. Yeah, right, right, in 30 seconds, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think if I, were to, if I were to really emphasize two points, I think it would be the first is really around transparency of options and um, presenting 
all of the available options to patients and really letting them um, think about which ones align best with their goals. Um, and and di- people have different goals as you know, as we all do, um, but really understanding and, and, and presenting these options in a way that patients can understand what the implications are for they, their day-to-day lives and their ability to kind of complete their bucket lists. Um, I think that's the most important one. And, the and, second and for that is, one, do you, do you see a difference between uh, providers who've been doing this for a long time, dialysis providers versus uh, kidney doctors who who just came out of training. Like, is is are you seeing culture changing? Um, I'm. I think we we are in general um, not as much as as <laughs> as I would mm-hmm. hope. I thought that we would see a lot more of that. Um, so we see some of it in um, in some of the younger providers that we've talked to. But actually, some of these older providers who've been, been practicing for a while who have reflected on these experiences of moral distress, I think are really the biggest advocates for um, patient autonomy and decision-making. Um, like one of them, one of my favorite quotes from the paper um, and from these interviews is this older uh, nephrologist who said, um, I have become more respectful of the notion that a few more days or a few more months might be meaningful to people. So it hasn't made me more eager to do intrusive and painful things to frail old people, but it makes me feel less guilty and less passionate and less angry when they demand it. And I think that's, you know, for people who, who ultimately choose dialysis against advice, but I think the reverse is also true, right? Is that kind of, if you, if you think about these salient experiences when things haven't gone right, and you realize that maybe you don't have all of the answers and you need to really talk to the patients more about which option best suits them. I think that's where things go best. Right. And then well, payment reform. I think that's the other big key that you guys have, uh, have you know, signaled. And, and what type of payment reform? Do you like do you have an idea of what it could be? I think more clearly um, designating what is involved in conservative management and setting up um, a payment model for that. Um, in, which would include multidisciplinary teams and palliative care um, would be really helpful uh, yeah. for nephrologists. I think even in just thinking about their, um, you know, their approach to older adults. Mm-hmm. It, the part of the problem there is uh, right. The nephrologist has to be involved. I think it seems like there, there should be pressure brought to bear on sort of both fronts. On the one hand, um, we need to have options other than dialysis. We need to have a robust system of conservative management. We need to have teams, as you say, providing interdisciplinary care for for people um, and, uh, and and some sort of uh, mechanism to support that financially. On the other hand, we also need, I think we probably also need pushback on the tremendous money-making industry of dialysis in the United States and that, you know, kickbacks to doctors, et cetera, who can just make a tremendous amount of money rounding in these centers. If you don't, if you, if you still have that tremendous financial incentive to dialyze your patients, and, um, uh, I, I worry that the answer shouldn't just be that we give them, we would also give them a f- financial incentive for conservative management. We also need to address um, the, uh, the, the scope of the, uh, profit motive in uh, in in choosing a dialysis option. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think that's it's very important to keep in mind, kind of as we we think about how to shape this um, this option in the future. Thanks, Alex. We just lost our sponsor, Davida. Damn from- it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I th- you know, there's there's room for everyone. I think I think it's about um, viewing the patients more holistically. And you know, I think that, that these were debates that were happening with dialysis companies a while back. With, you know, with respect to referral to transplant, um, and not to say that that's been perfected, but it's I think it's improved. Um, you know, with CMS's mandate to include transplant education and. All of these things, so I think that there's hope, um, but change is, yeah, change is needed. And it also sounds from from a palliative care and geriatrics perspective, there's a lot that we can do on our end. I mean, just looking at what the nephrologists are saying is that they feel like they they're alone, they and they can't do this just by themselves, especially around conservative management. Um, 
and they you said many described a need for palliative care consults um and I think that's something that uh, we can do better as a field is actually start working with our colleagues in nephrology to be in more involved in these individuals' care. Yeah, I, I totally wholeheartedly support that. I think that would be really helpful. Even just thinking about, you know, is dialysis the only way to manage some of these symptoms, right? So a lot of the nephrologists kind of describe it as, um, as a way to, to palliate um, some of the symptoms that patients are feeling, but there must be other ways to do that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and it's, it's fascinating too, is that some of the symptoms may actually not be improved with dialysis uh, or their function may not be improved, especially in nursing home, older mm-hmm. nursing home patients. Good study on actually function doesn't right. significantly improve dialysis from most yep. patients. From Stanford, nice New England Journal paper. Yeah. We should wrap it up. Is there anything else you wanted to uh, say today? No, I think that this is a this is a ripe area for um, a lot of good collaborative work, palliative care, geriatrics, nephrology, social work. Um, it's a growing population in need, um, and so I'm I'm glad to see a lot of good work in this area. What's next for you? What's next for me? Uh, summer vacation. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're starting actually, um, we have a, um, a large multi-site trial of a decision aid, a patient facing decision aid um, geared towards older adults um, to help them navigate these choices. Um, and so we are um, in our, let's see, second or third month of this three year trial. Um, and so we're hoping to see if we can help patients and their care partners um, choose options that better align with their values and their preferences. That's great. Is, yeah. is, is that decision aid uh, available? Probably not yet, right? After the um, study? So Yeah, it's in the last stages, uh, but it will be available on our uh, on our lab website and I'll send it to you guys and also um, from the National Kidney Foundation. Terrific. Wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, Karen. Alex, no, do you want to do you want to send us off with more of a song? Yes, if you join me for part of this. <laughs> oh no, it go, it gone. Bye bye. Who I? I think I sink and I die. If you want to destroy my sweater Hold this thread as I walk away away. Watch me unravel I'll soon be naked Lying on the floor Lying on the floor I've come undone Yeah! (laughs) There we go. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I want to thank all our listeners. We will uh, look forward to seeing you next week.